Chicago and the Philippines. A comprehensive review of the week's special community events, featuring many exciting personalities handled by the most professional Chicago Philippine Reports TV staff. Good afternoon and welcome to the Chicago Philippine Reports TV, still the number one Filipino show in the Midwest. I'm Gurley Pascual. Today we have all the top stories from the Philippines and our Filipino-American community of Chicago, plus special segments from Europe. We have our special segment hosts, starting with our executive producer, Ms. Veronica Layton, and her special interviews, followed by Bridget Cutero Carino, our co-host. All these are coming up and more afterward from our sponsors. Please stay with us. Arrivederci. Get ready for the ultimate in fresh produce, barbecue, seafood, sushi, and more. Meals made easy. Kimchi with wow. Our dishes make you a star. H Mart. presidential frontrunner Bongbong Marcos is screening contenders to be part of his cabinet as well as to other government agencies. Marcos' chief of staff and spokesman, attorney Vic Rodriguez, says some members of the executive committee behind his successful campaign, who are also part of the transition team, will be given cabinet positions. Some members of uh, the, our transition team would uh, form part of uh, his uh, official uh, cabinet. And uh, these are the same people that we have worked with and I think uh, enjoys the, that level of uh, trust and confidence as well as uh, have shown their, uh, that degree of competence uh, for them to be qualified for whatever portfolio that uh, President-elect Bongbong will assign them. Rodriguez asserts Marcos is willing to appoint those who are not allied with him for as long as they are qualified and competent. Kinakailangan mahal mo ang bansang Pilipinas. Kinikilala mo ang watawat ng Republika ng Pilipinas. Kinakailangan rinirespeto mo ang saligang batas at hindi ka nanawagan o nananawagan ng papagbabagsak ng gobyerno. Yun ang kinakailangan natin, yung may pagmamahal sa Pilipinas, yung may paggalang sa Pilipino, at yung handang magsakripisyo. Marcos's camp did not release any names on Thursday. Rodriguez says the incoming administration's economic managers will undergo careful screening, especially since we are still in the middle of a pandemic. Of course, the economy is very important. That's why we're mindful that his... Um, his uh, term will commence noon of June 30, we still have time to really go through uh, a tedious vetting process and especially his uh, would-be economic team and economic managers. Mm -hmm. Ang kalaban natin ay ang unemployment, kakulangan ng opportunity, underemployment. Asked about the recently banned e sabong, Rodriguez says Marcos will study how to balance what it contributes to the economy and its negative effects. Pag-uusapan yan, um, how to balance yung the need of uh, the government for revenue, especially now uh, he will be faced with uh, 13 trillion uh, debt. But at the same time, uh, old school talaga itong si President-elect Bongbong, he values family. So he's also looking at the downside of it, which is in social cost. At uh, may mga report na may mga bata na, Marcos has someone in mind for the foreign affairs portfolio, but no name was made public. Rodriguez was cautious in addressing the issue on a contempt order against Marcos by the District Court of Hawaii on the matter of compensation of martial law victims. He assured Filipinos Philippine-U.S. relations will be better under a Marcos administration. Meanwhile, the Presidential Transition Committee will be led by outgoing Executive Secretary Salvador Medialdea. The palace issued an order directing government agencies to create their own internal transition committees for the smooth transition of power. Since we still have no proclaimed winner, official talks 
need to be put on hold for the moment. But preparation on our end need to begin. We, after all, have more work to do. We assure the public that within the coming weeks, the entire executive branch will continue to perform and dispense with its duties, but ready to turn over the reins of the, to the next president. Leading vice presidential candidate Sara Duterte expressed gratitude to presidential frontrunner Bongbong Marcos for trusting her to lead the Department of Education. This was Duterte's response to Marcos's announcement Wednesday night that he plans to appoint her as the next Secretary of Education. Duterte notes to ensure a stable administration and avoid any opportunity for critics to so intrigue about her loyalty, she welcomes the decision to let her lead the education department. Duterte explains she has been given the task to produce skilled learners and guide the next generation of patriotic Filipinos who advocate peace and discipline in their communities. Duterte also thanked Education Secretary Leonor Briones for her dedication in implementing education reforms under the current Duterte administration. Secretary Briones says they are ready for the transition of leadership as well as the turnover of the Basic Education Plan 2030. But for some stakeholders like the Teachers' Dignity Coalition, they prefer a new secretary coming from the public school system. But if Duterte becomes the next education chief, they are ready to share their concerns and issues that need attention. This includes plans to strengthen learning about history culture, and Philippine literature, as well as lessons that would tackle martial law. Tinatanggap po namin ano, na maaaring dito po sa usapin na ito, magkakaroon po tayo talaga ng, uh, ng kaunting um, conflict. No? And uh, of course, no, kami po ay nakahanda naman. Ano, uh, naniniwala po kami no, na ang history po natin ay recorded na. Ang history po natin ay established na. May facts na po ito. Hindi na po, hindi na po ito po pwedeng baguhin. The Alliance of Concerned Teachers also notes Duterte has not articulated her platforms on education. Hearing that uh, non-education uh, person, no? Uh, is going to head the agency for the next six years. Medyo uh, kinakabahan kami dito. Is she qualified? Definitely. She's a lawyer. And the biggest qualification, I think, it's indisputable. She has the confidence of the 31 million Filipinos who voted her into office. As to her competence, it, it, let's, let's give her a chance to prove that she's able to, that she can run ably the Department of Education. Teachers groups also hope the incoming administration will respond to their concerns, including a salary hike, support for blended learning, and other much-needed reforms. This is the future. Forget what you know about currency, commerce, investment. The age of Bitcoin is upon us. And now anyone, anywhere can turn cash into crypto with a coin flip ATM. Booyah. With low fees and 24-7 support, CoinFlip makes crypto so flippin' easy. Go to coinflip.tech to find an ATM near you. Via Times, vital news, vibrant views for the Filipino-Asian communities in Chicago. Via Times, for your most interesting and exciting reading and your party coverages. Via Times has very interesting columnists. You name it, Via Times has it. Law, Filipino news, dentistry, immigration, humor, serious opinions, health, beauty, mysticism, bata corner, showbiz, and intelligent written editorials. Call Via Times at 773-866-0811. Magandang hapo po sa inyo lahat and welcome to the Rodia segment of the show. And today I have a very interesting and exciting and inspiring personality who will be talking to us about a very interesting topic for this month. This month is also, though it's very busy with all kinds of uh, hectic activities and events, this month is also has a very special uh, event, which is called the Foster Care Awareness Month. And uh, for um, for a starter, I I invited Mr. Ed Hagem to appear to the show, and he will be talking to us 
as a foster care child in his childhood. And also he will be telling us about his experiences and inspiring stories while he was in a foster care. Help me welcome Mr. Ed Hey Jim. Hi, nice to be welcome to our show. I know you're from Florida and um, you are of um, a Syrian uh, background. Yeah, in 1900, the family came over. Okay, um, let's hear from let's hear from Mr. Ed Hajim about his background. And uh, Ed, will you please tell our viewing audience uh, about your uh, childhood background? Well, it starts, I guess, in 1939 when mother and father got divorced. Father was a very difficult character. He had lost everything in 29 and was an angry man, unfortunately. But, and my mother couldn't live with it. He also had trouble keeping a job. So they got divorced in 1939 and she moved me from Los Angeles where we were living to St. Louis. My, she got custody of me completely and he got visiting rights and $5 a, a week of child support and uh, uh, alimony. Uh, he, in the first month he took that trip 1800 miles from Los Angeles to St. Louis and picked me up to take me to a movie or take me to the park. But instead of doing that, he got back on Highway 66 and took me back to Los Angeles. He essentially kidnapped me and told my mother not to look for us. I never saw a picture of my mother after that, never knew anything about her. And he told me subsequently that she died. Uh, for the next two years, dad and I lived together. He's a merchant Marine. So I spent most of my time living with a neighbor lady, a woman named Mrs. Benson. He came back and forth when the ship was in port. When the war started in 1941, he was drafted or he volunteered to become an officer in the Merchant Marines. And I was placed in the Catholic welfare system in Los Angeles. In the next five years, I lived in five foster homes. They, they varied from being you know, abusive and pretty awful to very, very good. And uh, I learned a lot of lessons. I was in five different Catholic foster homes, five different Catholic schools from 1941, 42 to 1946. Uh, when the war ended, my father ended up in New York and flew me across country. Uh, we spent the next year together uh, in uh, the YMCA on 34th Street and also a hotel room in Coney Island. Unfortunately, he couldn't get land-based work, had to go back to sea. And I ended up in a, an orphanage in Far Rockaway, New York. Uh, after I aged out of that, and unfortunately my father disappeared, I ended up in a second orphanage in Yonkers, New York, where I graduated from an excellent high school and got a scholarship to the United States Navy. And that really changed my life. But that's, that's the, the bumpy road. It was a bumpy road, a lot of disadvantages. But as I said in my book, a lot of these disadvantages become advantages. Living in 15 different locations, you become quite adaptable. Going through each one of these different experiences, you become quite, quite self-reliant and a lot of other things. But you do pick up some not such good things like anger. You keep asking yourself, why me? And that is not very healthy. And it, it, that lasts a long time. It lasted into my, into my, actually into my mid forties before I was able to really get a hold of the anger and, and direct it. But I've been directing the anger and I tell young people, try to direct that anger instead of externally, direct it internally to drive yourself to do better. With the feeling of anger, uh, which nobody can, no, no one really can blame you for being angry uh, um, because of the abuses and uh, <clears throat> and of course many bullies uh, that must have uh, re re you must have really encountered when you were young. Uh, did you did you re get mad at everybody or were you mad at the world? I was mad. I was mad at the world. It's, it's a why me? Why should I not have parents? Why? Why during my 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 you know grammar school graduation nobody came? Why did my high school graduation nobody came? Why my college graduation, my graduate school nobody came? You get pretty angry, but you if you're careful and you learn that that external anger does you no good when you're angry at the world, angry at somebody else. Take anger at, and put it into yourself and drive you to do better, to exceed, to succeed in whatever you're doing. That's energy you can use in that direction. 
So instead of using it in the wrong direction, out externally against people, against the world, use it internally and drive yourself to do better. That's what I did and I started to do that. You learn very quickly that external anger does you no good. The internal anger can be very helpful. You can push yourself to do better with that anger. Until how old were you that you felt that kind of anger within yourself? Oh, as a youngster. I mean, I, I was a very serious college student, you know, and I, and I, I didn't, I was not, a, I'm not a, a giggler. I wasn't a laugher and so forth. I was always trying to move ahead. And so I was now pretty serious. As my wife says, even today, she says, yeah, you're funny, but not fun. <laughs> really? But it was your wife that uh, changed you, right? That is the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, I, I, I ran after her till she caught me. She decided she was going to marry me when she was a little girl. And uh, she followed me out to San Francisco and we got married. And we've been married for 56 years. We have three children and eight grandchildren, seven grandsons. And uh, it's been her that basically has, has changed my life. She's someone who really supports me. I support her. It's someone, you know, as, as I said, I love her more than yesterday and less than tomorrow. But she's very special. And if, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here today. Wow. Shima is a really big God sent to you. <laughs> exactly. Right? That's how exactly. it is. Right? Exactly. Okay. Do you sometimes uh, um, tell your children and grandchildren, maybe, uh, your, your sad story when you were young? Well, I didn't. You see, I buried my story. When I graduated high school to go to college, I decided I would bury my story completely. I wouldn't tell him. My father was a merchant marine. We lived in a post office box. My mother died when I was three. That was the end of it. A little bit of denial doesn't hurt. And I didn't have to explain it to everybody about orphanages and foster homes and so forth. And I buried it until I was actually 75 years old. At that point in time, my, my wife and my kids and the University of Rochester started probing and said, you know, you should write this down when he started to find out what it was about. And I figured I'd write, a, write, write it down and print it and give it to, you know, a few friends and my family. But as you'll see in the back of the book, I sent it to 15 people ex externally. And they all said, no, no, you can't just print this for your family. You should take it to a much wider audience. And so, in fact, one woman, a number of people said, every freshman in every college in the United States should read this book. So I decided to embark on that. And it fits in with my life because one of the things I've been very lucky in, I always ask what's next. And given my age now, as you can tell, I'm not exactly a kid anymore. Uh, what's next is this book. It's given me a great deal of satisfaction. I'm helping young people. I got a letter the other day from somebody's mother who said that basically her daughter has decided to go to college because she read my book and she listened to me on, on one of the videos. And that really gave me a good, uh, gave me a great feeling for, for what I'm doing right now. So I have two other books to follow, which are in the same vein. And this is something for me to do. It's something for me to really communicate with people. And at this stage of life, this is a, you know, a real gift. So I find that 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 all of these things sort of fit together. And this is why my life has been one one step after the other. And this is it seems like the next step. Has uh, foster caring turn you into into one of the parents who adopted kids too? Or uh, were you involved in the foster care? No, I, I have not been. I mean, I've been, I've been dealt with students who come from foster care. I'm a, 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 trust, a trustee or, or a director of a group called Wiley in Boston. They, they have 72 foster care kids that are in colleges in Boston. And they basically require those students to talk to a counselor at least once a month. And I'm very involved with that. The woman who runs it's fantastic. And I think that's one of the things that, and there's another an organization of Northeastern University the same way that I'm involved with kids in foster homes. Kids in foster homes don't flunk out of college academically. They flunk out usually socially. They need someone to talk to. And especially during COVID, these kids had no place to go. And so this organization basically took these kids and placed them all through, uh, throughout Boston. So I'm involved to that extent. I mean, but I'm involved more with young people in, in the university level, the high school level. And either, it's, it's, if they come from very bad backgrounds, I can be helpful. Uh, but this is the, this Wiley group and the group in Northeastern, they're really foster kids only. And I think that's where I try to spend my time, try to communicate them. They will get through, give them the feeling 
that the first year is very bumpy. It's very difficult because they, they, they think they're different. And that's what the real problem is. It's not that you are different as a foster child as you think you're different. And you, you, do, you don't have the background. Right? Simple things like I never learned to ride a bicycle, never learned to swim very well because that wasn't available to me as a child. And you also have, a, you're a little bit lonely and you have, you have feelings that are different than other people's feelings. And in my day, it was really difficult, difficult because poor kids didn't go to college. You know, orphanage, the orphanage, they didn't go to college. And if you were, you weren't exactly accepted. Like more and more today, people are accepted from those backgrounds. Because of the traumas, childhood traumas that you have encountered when you were growing up uh, as a foster judge, a care child, do you feel that um, uh, with the books that you you said you're writing, did, did you, are you, have you published the book? No, I, I, I published the book yet, On the Road Less Traveled. On the Road Less Traveled. I like the title. And, um, okay. An unlikely journey from the orphanage to the boardroom. I, the you know, I served on a number of boards of direct, directors and I always tell the story. I, I arrived at the University of Rochester in a black leather jacket and an, an NRTC scholarship. And 50 years later, I became the chairman of the board. So that's the trip. Okay. And the book, book well, tells the whole story. Where can our viewing audience are, get a copy of that book? You can get, it's on Amazon. It's Simon & Schuster. And you can go to my website, www.edpagem.com. And there's a little button you can push there and also get the book. And it's also on Audible. Uh, the fellow who read the book, the narrator, is very good. And he basically did a, a terrific job. And I'm a now a, more of a listener than I am a reader. I love listening to books. And I, so I have it on Audible as well. All right. Okay. So, uh, okay. So uh, what your, your difficult childhood made you survive and be an inspiration to many people out there, uh, particularly those people who had experiences in their in uh, living with uh, foster families, right? That's right. Okay. It's just prove to people that anything is possible. Come to a foster home, you can be successful. It doesn't set you back. You know, in fact, it gives you certain advantages. You learn how to handle change. You learn how to handle strange situations you learn how to handle difficult situations so it comes back it can be a an advantage so overall ed uh, uh, what good things can you say about uh, our system of foster care here in this country it's terrifically improved it, it's it's take huge leaps ahead today the counselors uh, the the people involved the, the the processes are, are superb. And they also do one thing that they didn't do before. They're grouping kids together. Kids from foster homes now have groups. And so you don't feel like you're all alone. That's a huge change. There are a number of organizations with, like, like the Wiley Group in Boston, uh, Posse, that put kids together that all come from the same backgrounds. So they don't feel they're that, that different. And that's very important. That's a huge change and very important. Also, it's been better, been much better funded. In, in my era, many of the foster care people took you because they needed the money. And it wasn't really, you know, because they really wanted someone to live in the house. So there, uh, there has been a huge change. Uh, that was the change that was due to what? Uh, government? Uh, uh, I, I think government, government had, had a part in it. I mean, I think the regulations have been much more stringent, but there's just been a, an influx of people. Into the, into the business to really improve it. Uh, this woman, Judy, Judy King, who runs Wiley, she was a social worker and she left that work to form this group to, to really help foster kids. There've been a, just an influx of, of, of a lot of very, very fine people that wanted to do, you know, do, do something for foster kids. Currently, uh, do you have um, the data for how many, how many uh, uh, foster kids are there in this country? I don't know. I think it's well over a million. Well over. Yeah. Wow. Okay. One last word. One last word to our viewing audience or to some uh, 
uh, families that have um, experiences with the foster care home, uh, can you please say um, an inspirational word for for the occasion? I, I just I just want to say thank you to all the foster parents that take a child in, and you have a huge impact on that child, and you, you're doing something that really can, that changes the world, makes it a better place. That child can now flourish because of your interest. And I can say to him, my my last foster parents were the, the Robs in, in Los Angeles. They treated me just like their son, and it gave me actually a framework for my family. It taught me what a real family was like. And when you have a foster child and you give that foster child that feeling that this is the right way to run a family, you've done something really unusual and something that will last for a very long time. Very good. Okay. I salute you, Ed. Uh, Ed Hagem uh, for uh, the life, life sad, sad experiences that you have encountered and, uh, and for being a role model and an inspiration to many people out there and for being a new book author. <laughs> and thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. Have a great day. Have a great day. And what I always say is like, may the force be with you. The force be with you. All right. Okay. The force be with you. You. Monica, thank you very much. Have, have a good one. All right. Have a good one. Bye. 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 Salamat in our language. Thank you very much. Magandang hapong po sa inyo lahat. And welcome to Veronica's segment of the show today. I have a very young, beautiful, talented, really smart uh, young Vietnamese uh, girl who will be talking to us about the Asian American Pacific, um, um, Pacific Islanders. Because um, the month of May is the month of... Uh, celebration of uh, Asian American and Pacific Islanders month, right? That's um, it, yeah. Okay, and we have here today uh, Miss Lynn Nguyen from, uh, she's, uh, her origin is Vietnamese, but she has, she was born in, uh, and raised here in uh, North America. Um, and Lynn, as the uh, senior advisor for AAPI, which stands for Asian American Pacific Islanders, will be talking to us about a particular project for this month. Help me welcome Lynn Wen. Hi, <laughs> Lynn. How are you? You're so Hi. And uh, uh, congratulations for your new baby. Thank uh, you. Thank uh, you, Veronica. And Lynn is here. We invited her uh, to talk about a project called uh, RUN, mm -hmm. which stands for what, Lynn? RUN. RUN. Yeah, RUN. Rep it means represent us now. And so this, this organization that I've been working with, Veronica, we are a really interesting political group of young Asian Americans. And a lot of what we do is, one, we educate, we encourage, um, and we mobilize young Asian Americans to vote. And uh, as you know, like this group is becoming a lot more powerful, we're becoming a lot louder, and we are becoming a lot more critical in how political parties can win. You know, it, as part of like a young Asian American group, we were growing across this country. And so uh, that's the work that we do. And we've been here for almost like uh, uh, four or five years now doing this work. Lynn, how long have you been involved with the AAPI? Oh, my goodness, Veronica, I've, um, I know I look young. I look very young. Um, I've been doing this work, I think, for almost 12, 13 years. Um, and usually, Veronica, I'm, I'm hired by political candidates 
uh, Democratic political candidates to come onto their campaign and, and help them like build their strategy and help them understand like these are the needs of Asian Americans. If you if you need to connect with young Asians, this is what you need to do. And so I've, I've usually been brought on um, to help devise the strategy around that. And uh, I'm here in Texas. So Houston, as you know, is it's home for me. And we have uh, someone running for governor here. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, Veronica, but his name is Beto O'Rourke. Um, and I'm also an advisor on his campaign. Lynn, uh, well, so in that position that you have, yes. how do you think, really, how do you think you know, we can really amplify our Asian voices in mm -hmm. this as a, because we are, of course, a batch of uh, Asian immigrants here. Yeah, that's right. And same with my parents, same with my family, Veronica. I mean, I think the the this is like we're in a very big election year. You know, twenty twenty two. It's it's the midterm elections. You know, not too many people are kind of watching what's happening right now. But I, I hope that people start to feel it as we get closer to November. But I think one of the greatest, and I, I just hope, and this is like the reason why we started Run API is like, we are like screaming to political parties, any any political party, like y'all need to pay attention to who we are. You know, we, we're only growing in size, we're growing in population and, and really here in Texas, and I think you know this, Veronica, but Houston, Dallas, even in, in San Antonio and Austin, there are so many different pockets of who Asian Americans are, and especially us in, in the South, it's so different. Um, but I think a lot of candidates, a lot of organizations are starting to watch, right? And Veronica, if, if you remember in, in 2021, just earlier last year, you know, in the state of Georgia, so I had a chance to be in, in Georgia and I was working with Senators uh, Ossoff and Senator Warnock, and they hired me to engage with Asian Americans in the state of Georgia, right? And, and the Asian American vote in Georgia helped elect some of the like top Congress members in the state. Like we really turned out in numbers. And I think that really shocked a lot of people. And so for this year in, in 2022, and you know this, but 2024, that's another really big election year for the presidency. Um, a lot of political parties, a lot of political candidates are starting to ask, where are the young Asians? How do we reach them? How do we get to them? And how do we know what they're thinking? And that, so that's what we do. That's what, that's what the organization that I work with. Uh, we focus on, on briefing candidates. How big is AAPI? Oh, good question, Veronica. I think right now, and this is across, across the country here in America, we are close to 24 million Asian American Pacific Islanders in this country. 24 million. 24 million. Mm -hmm. uh, are they uh, active members? So? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what what's so, it was uh, one of the best times I've ever had, Veronica. I was in Las Vegas, in Nevada uh, in 2020 and, and like getting the community ready to vote in, in the presidential election. And I had a chance to work with like some of the most active Filipino leaders in Las Vegas. Like, I'm sure you know this. There is such a large Filipino population in Las Vegas and they they really wanted to bring in community members and actually like educate them. Like this is how you vote during a presidential election. Um, and in, in the state of Nevada, you don't just vote in a primary, but you actually participate in a caucus, uh, which is like very large community meetings. Uh, you select who you want to be president. Um, and I worked with a number of Filipino leaders just to get people ready to do that. And so I, across this country, I've, I've had a chance to travel um, uh, and I've had a chance to, to work with some of like the most resilient Asian American communities uh, across the state. There were just, I think we've like only seen the tip of the iceberg, you know, in terms of our political power, in terms of our voice, people are, are like just starting to pay attention to who we are. Are there any obstacles that you've encountered mm -hmm. so far as a group oh. of in Americans or Pacific Islanders? Yeah, I oh Veronica, that's a very good question. <laughs> and I think like you know this, so you're you're a journalist. I'm sure you you see this often, but I think some of the greatest challenges I think is that one, um, and like you know this with the rise in anti-Asian violence, you know, the, the rise in, in hate crimes uh, within our own communities in the last a couple of years, and even now, like here in Texas, we we had like such a horrific shooting in Dallas. I don't know if you saw that just yesterday, and a gunman had uh, uh, unfortunately shot at three Korean women 
in Dallas. And that was a very targeted uh, uh, incident. And so and we're seeing this so often. I think some of the greatest challenges right now that I'm not seeing enough of is that you know, we're, we're, we're in a very critical political election year. And I just, I don't see enough of our uh, political candidates, our elected officials taking the time to actually ask us if we're okay, ask us what, what the community needs are. And specifically with young Asians, I, I just, I don't see enough of an effort to actually connect with us. You know, like we deeply care about who we are. We deeply care about being American and that this is this is our home country. But sometimes I feel like uh, uh, organizations haven't yet understood, you know, exactly what inspires us. You know, I think we're still doing a lot of that work. As a um, political group, you consider yourself a political group, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, more on the uh, democratic leaning. Mm -hmm. Another, uh, of course, the Republican group. Uh, are there any Republican APIs uh, you're aware of? Oh, absolutely, yes, and they're very active. And I'll also say, Veronica, my my family, we are like split. <laughs> I have very conservative parents. Uh, my relatives here in Houston, we're, we're very, we are like all along the political spectrum and I love them very, very much. Um, but I, I, with both, part, whether they're Democrats, Republicans, independents, I think what's so interesting is that we, we still have such a strong sense of community. You know, no matter like what our political leanings are, I think that what we've what we've seen in, in talking to a lot of young, at least young Asians, they are very proud of, of their Asian heritage. They're proud to be Chinese, Filipino, Korean, um, Vietnamese. We, we just, the more that we talk to young Asians, the more that we find that they're, they're deeply proud of who they are and where they come from. Um, but to your question, though, Veronica, they, they're, yeah, whether it's uh, Republican uh, Asian Americans, Democrat, uh, Democratic Asian Americans, I think what's so interesting and fascinating to watch in the last, really in the last like six or seven years of doing this work is that there, there's so much more effort in connecting with Asians. And I think like the one thing that I hear a lot, I hear it very often is, is people saying, wow, like y'all really do vote. Y'all go to the ballot box. Y'all are exercising your right to, to vote and not even that, but exercising your, your voice. Um, and like I said, I think like with that, either political party, people are starting to watch what we're doing. Do you have, uh, personally, mm -hmm. do you have any plans for running into, uh, running for a political position oh. one of these days? <laughs> you know what, Veronica? I don't know how people do it. I have so much respect for the courage that it takes to run for office. I don't, I don't think it's for me. I love the behind the scenes. I, I love helping people strategize and, and understand how to do this work. I would love to hope that my daughter, even though she's she's just a few months old, I'd love to maybe see her do it. But for me, it's, it's not for me. I love that you asked that, but it's not for me. <laughs> really? I, uh, you might change your mind one of these. Maybe. <laughs> okay. How... What do you do in reaching out to other Asian Americans out there to join the AAPI organization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. There, there's a couple ways, and I think you like you y'all probably know this. Everyone that, that's watching this, I mean, young people in general, we're we're so online. Everyone is is online, whether it's uh, uh, looking for you know the the latest news on YouTube. Um, whether it's logging onto your Facebook or your Instagram or your or TikTok, which is like so huge now, of course, with young people. Um, but if, if I just I would love to have if anyone's interested with Run API and, and joining the work that we're doing and engaging with young Asian Americans, uh, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, um, and their handle is at Run R U N A A P I. Um, and we we do a lot of events. We have we hold conversations online. Um, we're gonna be doing a lot of work with Asian American influencers um, over the next few months. And of course, like we're, we're here to give out resources. If people want to get involved in, in politics, um, if people want to learn how they can vote, if they're registered to vote, uh, that's what we do. We're, we're a platform for resources. All right. Very good. Uh, one last word before we sign off. 
in, maybe you can invite some Asian Americans to participate in AAPI organization. Yes. Yeah, we would love to. Yeah. So a couple of things on that, Veronica, um, as I mentioned, the, the best way to connect with us, just like send us a message on, on social media, um, whether it's on Twitter or Instagram, but um, we, we are looking for as many young Asian American Pacific Islanders as possible to come help us and like build the campaigns that we want to build. Um, as I mentioned, our focus is on, on engaging with young Asian Americans. Uh, and we want to bring them in. There, there are so many of us across the country um, and our work is focused nationally. Um, and I think you know this, but I mean, people who are directly from the community, those are the experts in this field. They, they tell us this is what we need. This is what we'd like to see. And this is this is what we're not hearing enough of in politics. And so, yes, I just I would love to just welcome everyone um, to shoot us over a message and and our team will get back to you immediately. Well, Lynn, you are terrific. Oh. You are a very good Asian or AAPI leader out there. Congratulations yeah. for all the things that you do. And you can keep us updated yes and uh, don't forget us remember tita veronica of cpr tv all right i thank you for gracing our show today and thank you veronica and good luck to all your undertakings a senior advisor for aapi okay at maraming maraming salamat po sa inyong panonood. Ako po si Veronica. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye! We would like to welcome all of you to Baladna Jewelry. We have a very big selection of 21 karat gold jewelry imported from the Middle East, from Dubai, Saudi, and Bahrain. And we have a very big selection of diamond. We offer free financing for six months and uh, we have a layaway system which you can leave your stuff for three months. We repair gold and we buy old gold. Welcome to Baladna Jewelry. Salamat Bo. Hello, good afternoon, uh, CPR TV viewers. Uh, this is Pastor Ed from uh, Faith Family Worship Center, Chicago, coming to you again, uh, sharing a devotion with you. You know, tomorrow is uh, Easter Sunday for the Eastern Orthodox Church in Europe. I know we celebrated Easter last Sunday, but tomorrow, uh, April the 24th, is the, uh, the Easter celebration of the Orthodox Church. So, in relation to that, I would like to read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 3 and following. And then I will also jump to, uh, to verse 12 and, and the following verses after that. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. And this is Paul speaking. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Notice that is the gospel. If somebody asks you what is the gospel, that's in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and that he rose again. In a nutshell, that, that is the gospel. Verse 5, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as by one born out of due time. And what, what Paul is saying here is that uh, when Jesus rose from the dead, there were eyewitnesses. They saw him alive. And as a matter of fact, he mentioned that over 500 people saw him all at once uh, when he, uh, after he rose from the dead. So we have strong, solid eyewitnesses account of the resurrection of Jesus. And then we're going to jump on verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, 
how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And what Paul is saying here is, if, if um, uh, Jesus uh, did not rise from the dead, if he was not risen from, from the dead, then, you know, there, there is no sense in talking about the resurrection of the dead. Uh, you know, Jesus is the first fruits. Uh, he, he's the first fruit of the resurrection uh, of the dead, meaning he, he was the first one that conquered death, uh, physically, bodily resurrected from the dead. And because he rose again, uh, because he conquered death, uh, we as Christians, believers, will also experience the same thing, that we will be resurrected uh, once we die uh, someday. Uh, if the rupture does not take place in our lifetime, uh, we too will be resurrected from the dead, just as Christ was resurrected from the dead. And then verse 13, uh, same chapter, chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. See, our, our resurrection is, is heavily dependent on Jesus' resurrection. If Jesus did not resurrect from the dead, then there's no hope for for the resurrection of the believers uh, in the Lord. Uh, verse 14, And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. So, the, you see, uh, the resurrection is uh, very crucial, very critical in Christianity. Now, somebody said that Christianity rises or falls on the resurrection. Uh, the whole structure of the Christian faith rests on the foundation of the resurrection. So if you take the resurrection away, then the whole structure of the Christian faith uh, collapses. So it's, it's so important, so critical, um, that uh, the resurrection should be established as uh, an indisputable truth. All right, um, verse 15, yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. In fact, the dead do not rise. So, I mean, we're, we, we would be false witnesses uh, if, uh, if, there is, if Jesus did not uh, resurrect from the dead. All right? And then verse 16, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And so, uh, we will remain in this sinful, fallen condition if Jesus did not rise from the dead. Uh, you know, uh, because what's the use? Uh, uh, there is no sense of uh, exercising our faith, of having church, having fellowship, having worship services, if the person whom we are worshiping is dead or did not rise from the dead. And so, uh, this, is, this is an amazing uh, verses, passages of the scriptures. And I'm going to finish up with, uh, uh, with verse 18. Okay, this is connected with what Paul is saying from the pre previous verse, verse 17. So I'll start with that. And if Christ is not reason, then um, your faith, faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men, the most pitiable or most miserable. So uh, what Paul is saying is, you know, if, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then our hope is only here for the present. And, and there is no um, hope beyond this present life. Well, once we die, that's it. But praise God, Jesus resurrected from the dead, and that guarantees our own eternal life, our own resurrection. So uh, I'd like to greet each and every one of you a happy Easter. I know we celebrated it last Sunday, but it, like what I said, in the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, they are celebrating Easter tomorrow. We serve a risen Savior. Uh, Jesus lives, and because He lives, we can face the future. God bless you, and see you next time. Thank you.
Good afternoon. This is Bridget Karina Quetta bringing you this week's local news from our community. Chicago applauds Chicago City Council for producing a citywide ward map that creates Chicago's first Asian American majority ward and unifies Albany Park's Asian American and immigrant community into one ward. Asian American representation in City Hall has been long overdue, said Justin Sia, Democracy, Voting Rights, and Redistricting Council at Asian Americans Advancing Justice in Chicago. Our historic redistricting achievements will allow Asian American voters to have greater influence in local elections and help them elevate the unique issues that impact our community. Formerly splintered into multiple wards, Greater Chinatown residents will now be represented by one older person in Chicago's first Asian American majority ward. For the first time in history, the relics of St. Bernadette have left Lourdes, France to tour the United States from April to August 2022, visiting select churches and parishes around the country. As part of its tour, the relics of this famous Catholic saint will make a stop in the Diocese of Green Bay from June 12th through the 16th to visit the National Shrine of Our Lady of Good Help in Champion, Wisconsin. In addition to two parishes, St. Bernadette Parish in Appleton and Our Lady of Lourdes Parish in Des Pere. The Diocese of Green Bay will be the only stop for the relic within Wisconsin and its surrounding states for visitors to learn about the saint and venerate the relics. The veneration of relics is a beautiful tradition in the Catholic Church that allows the faithful to better contemplate and appreciate the life and witness of the saints to whom the relic belongs, said Rev. John Broussard and Rector of the National Shrine of Our Lady of Good Help. The veneration of a saint's relic is always oriented back to God and his love for us, shown brightly through the life and mission of that saint. Governor J.B. Pritzker and State Fire Marshal Matt Perez joined firefighters to honor and remember four fallen firefighters at the 29th annual Fallen Firefighter Memorial and Medal of Honor Ceremony. During the ceremony, the governor and fire marshal also honored firefighters who went above and beyond on the job, displaying courage, pride, and honor while protecting communities across the state. This memorial is dedicated to the firefighters of Illinois who have given their lives in the line of duty and to those firefighters who heroically led with courage, pride, and honor, said Governor J.B. Pritzker. Michael, Mashon, Mehdi, and Garrett will live on in our memories, in the lives of those they've saved and in the hearts of those they've touched. May their memories be a blessing. Today at the Fallen Firefighter Memorial, we honored four of our bravest brothers who gave their lives in service to the people of Illinois, said Illinois State Fire Marshal Matt Perez. We will be forever grateful for their courage and ultimate sacrifice in the performance of their duties. They put the lives of others ahead of their own, which is our highest calling. May is Mental Health Awareness Month and also coincides with the spring planting season. Spring and fall are often the most stressful times for farmers, and this year is no exception. The late start to spring has left many Illinois farmers scrambling to get their crops in the ground, causing stress to many in our rural communities. In 2019, the Farm Family Resource Initiative, FFRI, was established in Illinois to specifically address mental health needs of farming and agricultural communities. Led by Southern Illinois University School of Medicine, the FFRI launched a six-county pilot program to provide resources to Christian, Logan, Macon, Macoupin, Morgan, and Sagamon counties through a telephone hotline connecting farmers with mental health resources and providers. Funded through a USDA grant, FFRI expanded to all 102 counties in 2021. During the last legislative session, the General Assembly appropriated an additional $500,000 to ensure the program remains operational in all 102 counties throughout fiscal year 2023. Governor J.B. Pritzker has proclaimed May Childhood Drowning Prevention Month in Illinois, which serves as a good time to remind parents of the importance of constantly supervising children when they are in or near water to prevent the tragedy of accidental drowning deaths. 
In 2021, 18 Illinois children lost their lives in accidental drowning, eight in pools, three in bathtubs, two in lakes, two in ponds, and one each in a creek, a river, and a hot tub. All eight of the children who drowned in pools were aged five or younger. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, drowning is the leading cause of unintentional death for children ages one to four, and the second leading cause for unintentional death for children ages one to 14. For every child who dies from drowning, another eight receive emergency department care for non-fatal drowning. A child can drown in seconds, in silence, and in as little as one inch of water, said Illinois DCFS Director Mark D. Smith. We can prevent the tragedy of childhood drowning by actively watching our children anytime they are in or around water and practicing, reach supervision so an adult is always just in arm's reach away from children in water. That's all for today. Thank you for watching our news this week. This is Bridget. See you next time. And if I didn't greet you last Sunday, happy Mother's Day, or if it's coming, happy Mother's Day. We also would like to wish our May celebrants a very, very happy birthday. And that's our show for today. Ako po si Maria Gurley Pascual. We hope you enjoyed our show. Thank you for watching. Maraming salamat sa inyong pagsubaybay. And we'll see you back here next week. Ciao, Bella. Arrivederci from Italy.